Greetings, good morning, and welcome to church this morning. Our call to worship today is a very appropriate one for many of us here at Scott's, but for some, not yet. It's from Psalm 71, where the psalmist says, Since our youth, O Lord, you have taught us, and to this day we declare your marvellous deeds. Even when we are old and grey, do not forsake us, our God, until we declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. I guess that's a good summary of our job. Those of us who are older is to pass on the news of the mighty acts that our Lord has done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, a warm welcome to Scots Online, especially if this is your first time with us. As usual, if you're with us on Zoom, please stay online for a social chat after the service. And if you're with us on YouTube, we'd love it if you'll take a moment to share a message in the chat so we know you've been with us. Next week, Phil Court will be preaching for our grand final themed service, and you're invited to send me your favourite footy themed photo with you in it, either in team colours or with a famous player maybe or at a game. We'll share those in our grand final themed video for next Sunday. Also, it's not too late if you want to join us for Discovering the Bible by Zoom on a Tuesday night. The link for that is in the Friday Scots Weekly Newsletter. And if you're not receiving that newsletter, you can get on the list by contacting Wendy. As you're aware, if you are a regular on Zoom, we've been working week by week to improve the technical quality of the feed. We're close to having a full NBN connection set up in the church. And in the meantime, we're coming to you from the Robert White Hall. Immediately after the service this morning, we'll be asking you to help us by filling out a short online survey to let us know how the streaming went from your end. Very helpful if you could take a moment to fill it out. And if all goes well, you'll get a link to that as soon as you log out of our Zoom meeting. As usual though, Monty will be putting a full hi-fi quality version of the service on YouTube tomorrow. We're gonna to join now in a hymn that reminds us of the width of God's mercy due to what Jesus has done for us at the cross. Tim 187, there's a wideness in God's mercy. Our Father and our God, the God of holiness who is rich in mercy, we pray with the Apostle Paul that we, being rooted and established in love, might have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. May we know afresh this morning this love that surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled to the measure of all your fullness. 
Lord God, we live in fearful times, but help us not to fear. We live in times of confusion and distrust. Help us to trust in you. We live in times of uncertainty. May we find our certainty in you. And while we are physically separate from one another and from our loved ones, remind us again this morning that we are not separate from you. As we gather around our Lord Jesus as our temple, as we seek mediation with you through the Lord Jesus, our high priest, as we are confident that our sins are taken away through the Lord Jesus, our sacrifice. And we pray together now the words he taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Choir is going to lead us in the anthem, Now Rejoice in the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise and give you thanks for you are our shield and defender, the ancient of days. Thank you that your only begotten son, Jesus Christ, took on human flesh and was born into the human race and showed us the way to love everlasting. We thank you that by faith in him, our body, is a temple of the Holy Spirit and that we have the indwelling spirit of God living within us. Thank you that death no longer has dominion over us because Christ was raised from the dead and we too have received a newness of life. Thank you for this day, the day that you have created. Loving God, we praise and give you thanks for your presence with us. Bless us as we come together to praise and worship you. Fill us with the joy of your living word. Help us worship you in spirit and in truth, for God is the God of truth. Our divine healer, Jesus Christ, we pray for Australia. 
and the world in managing COVID-19. And may vaccines be available for all ages, strengthen and protect the frontline workers, the army forces, police officers, volunteers, and those involved in helping stop the virus from spreading in our communities. We pray for guidance, wisdom, and divine inspiration for our leaders. May their action and decision-making bring hope to all. We pray for those suffering from mental health issues due to the lengthy lockdown, especially among youths and uh, students in New South Wales and Victoria, as the interaction with their friends or relatives are limited. We pray for the year 11 and 12 students in preparation or for their exams. We do remember for the small businesses suffering lost income. And we do pray and remember the seniors at their homes or at the nursing homes facilities unable to see families and friends. Loving God, we pray for those who are sick for with COVID or seriously ill. And we pray for those who are in isolation. Loving God, you are the source of strength and protection. May all of them be filled with courage, strength, comfort, healing and peace from God Almighty, the source of our hope, our sustainer and life giver. We pray for your church in the world. We pray for our church and its constituents. Equip your church with your full armor of God and protect them from the plot of your enemy, the father of lies, the devil. Lead us as the body of Christ to be the hands and feet of Jesus wherever we are. Holy Spirit, help and fill us with the mind of Christ and to speak the language of Christ, which is love, so that Christ is preached everywhere in the world. We pray for divine increase concerning church growth and spiritual growth in our church and churches across every city and nation in your holy name. We thank you for the body of Christ everywhere in the world who are called to serve in such a time as this. We pray for those in our church community who are receiving treatments in a hospital or at home. We do remember and pray for Max Griffiths, Mary Lachists, Mary Ormi, and Reverend Christian Tirtas' beloved mother, who is currently seriously ill. We pray for God's healing grace and complete recovery for them all. May their faith in Christ Jesus sustain them that all things are possible with God. And we pray for world peace, peace in Afghanistan, Myanmar, and other countries in the world, God of all nations, as the world commemorates the 20th anniversary of 9-11 terrorist attacks in the USA. We pray for continued healing and hope for the nation and the families of the victims who lost their loved ones. Revive and heal the world that you have created, O oh God. May hatred be replaced with love, sorrow for joy, tears for laughter, and may weapons be replaced with reconciliation for Christ's sake. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Today's uh, scripture will be, read, will be read by Helen Holman. Today's reading is from St. John's Gospel, chapter 2, verses 12 to 25. After performing the sign in Cana, Jesus went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. Jesus cleans the temple courts. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at the tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. 
his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again, I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. Amen. We give thanks to God for the reading of his holy word. Uh, please, everyone, pray with me before we come to God's word together. Heavenly Father, this is your word, and we pray that you would help us to drill deep into it this morning, to understand it better, and to understand the great privilege we have as those who have come to the Lord Jesus. Uh, we ask these things that he might be glorified in us, and in his name we pray. Amen. I want to ask you today, where do you need to go to be closer to God? And is it somehow limited by lockdown? I know, for example, in every way, Scott's is a majestic building full of memories, awe inspiring in a wonderful way. But do you actually have to be here to draw near to God? What if in a few weeks' time there are the vaccine passports that everyone's been talking about? And if for some reason you can't get one and you can't come in? I mean, I know it means you'll be cut off from your church family, and that's not good. But does it mean you're cut off from access to God, which would be even worse? If that's the case, it's a bigger problem than just a virus, isn't it? Is God constrained to a box, to a building, to four walls and a roof? Is God somehow more present in a particular place than somewhere else, more accessible? If we lived in Old Testament Israel, the answer would be a definite yes, you meet God, you worship God at the temple in Jerusalem, which is where we find Jesus in John chapter 2, making trouble. As I'm sure you just heard in our reading, it's a passage all about Jesus and the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. A majestic structure that we've been told has taken 46 years to build. Though at this point in Israel's history, it really is the fourth version of what the Old Testament has described as the meeting place between heaven and earth. Version one, if you're familiar with the Old Testament story at all, was demountable. It was actually a tent that Israel took with them as they wandered around the wilderness. If you're someone who likes camping holidays, you'll know there's a variety of styles when it comes to tenting. There's the minimalist camper with one of those lightweight domes that pop up in five minutes and you're done. When we used to camp at Broom's Head, there, there were some people though who would go to the other extreme and set up a portable palace. One who'd even bring a little picket fence and the widescreen TV and the carpet laid out on the grass, everything that opens and shuts, luxury tenting. Now, Israel's tent was kind of like that, ornate carvings of angels and fruit gold overlays, the best timber tent poles, rich embroidery. God says, build me a tabernacle. That's what it was called. As a constant reminder that I am in your midst. It's a tent of meeting, meeting with God. It's portable because they're on their way to the promised land. Exodus 25 verse 8, God says to Moses, have them make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them place to meet with God right in the middle of the camp, the dwelling place of God with his people here in the camp of Israel. And when they build it, the glory of the Lord fills it. 
so that even when they come into the promised land, it is still a place where they meet God until the time of King Solomon, who builds Israel's first temple. This time they call it the house of God. Because they figure it's not right for the king to have a palace for a house when God's only got a tent. And again, it's opulent. Even though Solomon in his dedication prayer knows that God's not contained or constrained to the temple, he thanks God that he is prepared to dwell there with his people. The meeting place between heaven and earth. The dedication of the temple comes in 1 Kings chapter 8, where again the glory of the Lord fills his temple. The bad news is, and I'm making this very brief, just a few hundred years later in 587 BC, after a string of unfaithful kings has led Israel deeper and deeper into idolatry, God hands them over into exile. The forces of Babylon march on Jerusalem, tears down the temple, takes the population into captivity and marches them all the way back to Babylon as exiles. Temple gone. Until 70 years later, Babylon is defeated by Persia. The people of Judah are set free. And in a patchy sort of way in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, they come home dispirited, broken, and start rebuilding the Jerusalem temple and patching up the city walls. Although the old men, we're told in Ezra chapter 3, aren't particularly impressed. Ezra says this, but many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, being laid are just a shadow of its former glory, a disappointment, a national disgrace, until the rule of Herod the Great, who just a generation before Jesus is appointed by Rome as king of the Jews and launches a huge temple renovation project that by the time of Jesus has been going on for decades, extending the temple, even reshaping the whole mountain with huge stone blocks overlaid with marble that from miles around you'd see gleaming in the sunlight on the hill, which is the scene as Jesus arrives at Passover time in verse 13 of John chapter 2, a scene bustling with people preparing for the high festival of the year. And as he arrives, the temple courts are full, not just of people, but of farm animals and birds being sold to the pilgrims for their Passover sacrifice. And there are money changes as well, because the temple tax has to be paid in a certain currency in a certain way. Now, here's the shock, especially if you've grown up singing gentle Jesus, meek and mild, look upon this little child as a lullaby, which I think has pre-programmed 300 years of adults with a pretty ineffectual version of Jesus. When the real Jesus, when he comes into the temple courts, is full, it seems, of indignation as he grabs some cords and makes a whip and drives out the sheep and the cattle from the temple courts and he scatters the coins of the money changers as he overturns their tables. And he says, get out of here. Stop turning my father's house into an emporium, which is the literal Greek word John uses. John says this, so he makes a whip out of cords and he drives all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scatters the coins of the money changers and overturns their tables. To those who sold doves, he says, get out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market, an emporium. So here he is, gentle Jesus, meek and mild, whipping, driving, scattering, overturning. Zealous, John says in verse 17, as he tells us the disciples only remembered later the words in Psalm 69, zeal for your house will consume me. Which I guess has a double edge to it as they reflect then on the opposition that these actions set in train that ultimately 
really do consume Jesus, as it logically enough stirs up instant opposition to him. Because the Jews, presumably the priests and the Levites at this point, they challenge him. And they say, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Who says you can just come here and overturn our market stalls? Who do you think you are? You know, it's interesting as readers at this point because we, of course, have just seen a sign a few verses back. We saw it last week. We know something that the Jewish leaders don't. They've got no idea who they're dealing with. But Jesus, rather than saying, well, I just turned some water into wine, here, I'll do it again, says something enigmatic instead which is what he usually does. If they want a sign that proves his authority, they'll have to wait a while. Here are his words. Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Which, of course, sounds like nonsense, given that it's taken Herod and son 46 years to build the temple they're standing in. But that's not what he means. Now, it's interesting, John's been flagging this idea since chapter one, that what the temple symbolizes, Jesus is. John one tells us that in Jesus, God becomes flesh. And though we don't spot it in most English translations, in verse 14 of chapter one, John says that he tented among us, that he tabernacled among us as God's dwelling. And the word became flesh, he says, and tabernacled among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as the only son from the father. So now, the very next chapter, same idea. This time language of the temple. They say to him, it took 46 years to build this temple and you want to raise it in three days. Now, of course, if you know the end of the story already, as most of us do, we already know the thing that's going to be destroyed and raised in three days is his body. But John explains it for us anyway in verse 21. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. And ultimately, after he's raised from the dead, with all the benefit of 2020 hindsight, the disciples finally catch on to what he's been saying all along that the meeting place between heaven and earth, that the place where you come to meet God is him, God in person, Jesus Christ. And the three-day rebuilding of that temple over and above anything else, his resurrection, that is the sign of his authority to drive out sacrificial animals because they're not going to be needed anymore to put an end to the temple sacrifices by sacrificing himself and the authority to call for the allegiance of followers even today goes right back to that resurrection the sign of his authority now it's clear from the gospel accounts when jesus died his disciples had virtually zero expectations that he'd do what he said he would. But you see, three days later, John and the other disciples, they are so convinced that they're propelled from that point to give up their lives for him. Which, working backwards then, leaves us with the implication that if, if what he says is true, that he is the dwelling of God with men, that places, that places like the Jewish temple, sorry, or, or places like Shinto temples in Japan, or places like Mecca, don't get us any closer to God in reality. It's why, unlike Muslims, Christians don't have to go on a pilgrimage to a special place, because God has already come to us, which is to say that if you come back to my original question this morning, which was where do you need to go to draw close to God? The answer, of course, is that you need to come to Jesus. 
which I can tell you is great news for times like this, when you can't really go anywhere. Do you think being stuck at home makes you somehow distant from God? Think again. Now, if you're not persuaded by that, you might remember that Jesus says later in John's Gospel, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Which means if we're in lockdown and you can't physically come to Scott's, it doesn't mean you're any further from God. I mean, you'll miss the stained glass windows and you'll miss the feeling of history and you'll, you'll realise, of course, the music sounds far better in person. Most important, you'll miss the encouragement of meeting in person with God's people. But if you put your faith in Jesus, you won't be missing connection with God. Because in Jesus, the word became flesh and tabernacles with us by his spirit. Which means if you have been feeling far from God, Maybe it's because you've actually been at a distance from Jesus. And you might be saying at this point, well, I'll believe it when I see it. I'd believe if he'd give me a sign. A friend of mine used to say that. He'd say, if Jesus wants me to believe in him, he can give me a neon sign in the sky that says, Dave, here I am. At the very least, maybe you're looking for some kind of in a spiritual experience that turns your life around. If you look at the last few verses of our passage, there's an interesting point being made about the nature of faith. Verse 22 says, After the resurrection, the disciples believed the scripture and the words Jesus has spoken. They're pretty slow on the uptake. But that's a subtle contrast, you see, to the other crowd who in verse 23 see the signs he's doing and believe in his name because of what they've seen take a look at the words if you've got the passage in front of you or it'll come up on the screen now while he was in jerusalem at the passover festival many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name and yet we're told in the next verse that jesus literally has no faith in them that he doesn't entrust himself to them because John says he knows what's in each person just as he did with Nathaniel under the tree. Because Jesus, sorry, I'm, uh, Jesus and John both want us to know that there is something about believing when you see it, about following Jesus because of his miracles it's not exactly what he's looking for. It's an idea that plays all the way through John's gospel to that one disciple who's famous for exactly that attitude. Do you know him? The other disciples meet the resurrected Jesus in the upper room. He's not there. And so they tell him about it. You might remember what he says. His name is Thomas, and he's gone down in history, not as empiricist Thomas, or scientific Thomas, but as doubting Thomas. It's John chapter 20. You might like to have a look at it later. And he says to the others, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. You might think, fair enough. And yet Jesus knows there are going to be generations of Christians just like us, who don't get to do that. And so I guess you might say, if you're an empiricist yourself, that Thomas was privileged. Because a week later, Jesus comes back, and this time Thomas is there, and Jesus knows exactly what he's been saying. And so he says to Thomas, now's your chance. Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe, which Thomas at that point, of course, does on both counts. He sees and he believes. But listen to what Jesus says next. 
Because when you do what Thomas did, I guess there's no real trust involved, is there? No relational trust, which is at the heart of what Jesus calls faith. Here are his words, John 20, verse 29. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Which is the way it works out for most of us. John says, that's why he's writing it all down, for those who don't get to see, but are called and willing to take Jesus at his word. It's a big ask, isn't it, for those of us who are modernists, who are evidence-based, empirical, analytical, love to measure things, love to test things, love to see things for ourselves. But faith doesn't actually work that way. I'm not saying it's meant to be a blind faith, but there's no room for evidence. But in the end, it's a matter of looking at the evidence of his resurrection and deciding whether or not you can take Jesus at his word, which is relational. Will you trust him? Because if you do, he will well and truly entrust himself to you, which countless generations of Christians have discovered for themselves and staked their lives on in the century since those words were spoken. Because, friends, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word himself tabernacles among us and within us by his spirit. And so shows us his glory, full of grace and truth. Let's pray. Our heavenly father, we thank you indeed that you have dwelled among us in Christ Jesus that you dwell among us now by the spirit he poured out upon us, that we have ready access to you through him, our temple, our high priest. Remind us afresh of that today. And in these tiresome days of lockdown, Father, we pray that we would draw strength in that, that you remain close to us through your son, our Lord Jesus. Draw us to him, we pray in his name and for your glory. Amen. Well, it's time for our final hymn. It's number 517, Fight the Good Fight with All Your Might.
Well, friends, thanks for being with us this morning here at Scott's Online. It's been good to have you with us, and we trust you've had an encouraging morning. Do stay and take part in the Zoom chat if you're with us on Zoom. Zoom, uh, And if you've been on YouTube, leave us a comment so we know you've been with us. Just a reminder that we will be asking you to fill out a quick survey before the chat time. No, sorry, it'll be after the chat, chat time as soon as you log off. Please take the time to do that. Uh, most weeks, various things work better or worse than other things, and we'll just be asking for your experience this morning to help us troubleshoot. Let me close with the benediction. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Amen.